Good afternoon. I'm here to tell you about consciousness, uh, to Deutsch, Bewusstsein. Uh, so consciousness is the only way we experience the world. By consciousness, I mean conscious experiences. Right now, there's a voice inside your skull. And there's a movie inside your, your head as well. It's a movie of, of me walking about and me talking. And the mystery, the central challenge has been, certainly since Aristotle and Plato first thought about this, how does this voice get inside your head? How is it that you can have any experience at all, whether it's hearing or, or feeling or smelling or being angry or remembering what you had for breakfast? Those are all distinct conscious states. Those are not only go hand in hand with experience, such as the one Carl just talked about, but they also go hand in hand with inner experiences. And in fact, the, uh, the most important philosopher for purpose of consciousness lived um, more than uh, 350 years ago, and he bequeathed to us what is known as the most famous deduction in Western thought. Namely, he first published it in French in 1637, uh, Je pense, donc je suis, uh, later on translated as cogito ergo sum. What he means in modern language is that the only, the only experience I have is my own experience. The only thing I know, I know about the world is the fact that I, ha I have experiences. I might be delusional, in fact, he talks very explicitly about that. I might be delusional about the character of my experience, but that I have experiences, that I have some experience is beyond any doubt. And thus, and only thus, I know I exist. This, this insight has really never been bettered over the last uh, 380 years. Um, so this is the one we used when, by we I mean Fra uh, Francis Crick, you may know uh, him, he, he uh, co-discovered the double helical structure of the molecule of heredity, DNA. And then over his last 30 years, he, he's, he focused on, um, on the question of consciousness. And I worked for him for the last 16 years. We published many papers and, and two books. And in order to get away from the internal philosophical metaphysical debates that were all very interesting and passionate, but they don't really lead to any measurable progress, we said, let's focus on the brain. Because we can track sort of the footprints of consciousness. We can, leave, we can track the footprints that consciousness leaves inside the brain. And so to do that, we, we postulated this, what, uh, what we call neuronal correlates of consciousness, what is now sometimes abbreviated as NCC. So there you are, you're walking along, you have a brain, and you're looking at a German shepherd, and you have a picture of a German shepherd in your head, and you don't think about it. But it's actually that, I mean, how does, the, how does the, uh, this picture come inside your head? And if I take a picture with my iPhone of a, of a, German, of a German shepherd, nobody believes there's a picture in sort of the mind of, of, um, of the iPhone. And so the, here what we're trying to focus on is what is the minimal set of biophysical or physical mechanisms that are jointly necessary to give rise to, to, to a conscious sensation of a German shepherd. And how does this set of physical mechanisms differ from the set of mechanisms that you need in order to hear, or in order to have toothpaste, or in order to be happy? Those are all different conscious states. Where's the difference among them? Do they involve different set of neurons? One possibility. Do they involve different parts of the brain? Are they, is there a particular type of special consciousness neuron or a particular type of neurotransmitter? Do they have to be located in a particular strategic important part of the brain? Does there have to be a particular vibration? Does this vibration have to be synchronized? These are all different ideas that, that, uh, uh, and that people have, have proposed. But this is a doable, this is a research program, and over the last 25 years, my colleagues and I have studied in great detail in, in people and also in, in, in animals, have studied sort of the, the, the neuronal footprint of consciousness. Now, this is all the more mysterious and interesting since we know from our own experience, and we know since Sigmund Freud and Friedrich Nietzsche, that most of what we do, of course, escapes uh, consciousness. And so we can ask, well, where's the difference between the part of the brain that doesn't give rise to consciousness and those that do? And then there are also other remarkable cases like this one. This was recently published, a, a young lady, 24-year-old lady in China. She has some language impediments, and she has some motor uh, dyskinesia, and she got her brain imaged, and then it turns out a large fraction of her brain is gone. She's one of the very rare cases of people who are born without a cerebellum. The cerebellum or little brain is at the back of the brain, and of the 86 billion neurons that we have, a typical human brain has, 69 billion, more than two or three neurons are in the cerebellum. And what this shows is that you, need, and you don't need, need these neurons in order to still have full panoply of human conscious experiences. 
The cerebellum isn't necessary. So this gives rise to the question, well, why not? They're neurons, they're very elaborate, they have action potential, they have these spikes that Carl was, was talking about, they have all synapses, what is it? And so these are sort of experiments, this is one by Stanley Hain, that tells us it is really the cerebral cortex on top of the brain, the one that's sort of a hallmark of, of mammals, sort of that takes up four-fifths of our brain by volume, that gives rise to any one specific conscious sensation. So if you hear something or smell something, or see red versus blue, or hear me versus um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who talks like me, uh, it is because different parts of the brain are active. But uh, functional brain imaging is cool, but it's very crude. It's like, it's like trying to look for your uh, keys from an airplane from 50,000 feet up. It's not very useful from a, um, uh, or it's not as useful as it could be from a neuroscientific point of view. So uh, um, as, as Carl just showed you, we, we can now take uh, beautiful pictures of subset of neurons, and these are the actors. If you want to understand anything about behavior, about behavior in normal individuals or in diseased, in pathologies, you need to know about these guys. You need to, uh, you need to know about uh, neurons. What electrons, particular outer shell electrons, are to chemistry, neurons are to, are to brain science and to behavior. So everything you are, everything you do, your memories, uh, your anxieties, they all arise out of neurons and their interactions. And so we need to study them. And this is very difficult, but we do this at a large scale. So now who is we? So we is an institute started by, uh, by and funded by Paul Allen. So Paul Allen is uh, one of the, the two people who together with Bill Gates started Microsoft. And he started this in institute, it's a non-for-profit institute, it's now 11 years old in, in Seattle. Here we, well, this is the building we're going to move into. Uh, he also gave us this uh, gorgeous new building. And we're now 270, but rapidly expanding to 500. And two years ago, we, we gave him a proposal um, uh, that uh, for, for a few very large projects over 10 years focused on the human brain and the mouse brain. And so I'm now the, the chief scientific officer of this very large project. And what, what is it? It's, I mean, the sort of science we do, it's different from university. We're closer to biotech, although we're not, we're not for profit, we're closer to biotech. We do big science, we do team science, and we do um, uh, open science. What I mean by that, we choose a few projects and we do them at scale, at a scale that cannot be done at university because we can involve 100 people, and engineers, technicians, large, large uh, infrastructure. We do things very reliable, very repeatably, and um, we do them in a team. We work with physicists and engineers, computer scientists, chemists, so we work in very large interdisciplinary team. And largely we do, o lastly we do open science. So everything we do, as soon as it passes quality control, we put out on the web. So right now, for example, if you wanted to, you could, uh, you could go to our website and you can f uh, download all the images, um, all, all the data we have. There's no IP, there's no login. It's all completely open science. So this is, for example, so some of the sciences we did. We published uh, in a few Nature papers several years ago. In normal, in no in neurotypical human brains, we, we, we express in a thousand different locations, we look at for the genes that are expressed. You know, if you're interested in a particular gene, where is it expressed in, the in many, many different locations throughout the human brain? And then we compare that to, to make very interesting discoveries about homogeneity of cortical and cerebellar tissue. We published this early on this year when several thousand mice, um, uh, using also fluorescent techniques that were already uh, alluded to several times today, we plot the, the long-range connections in several thousand mice. So let's say if you're interested in visual cortex and you want to know the connection from the visual brain to prefrontal cortex, you can now just go to our atlas and download the images. You can see them in 3D in great detail. And this is sort of a common resource that everybody can use. Uh, at, uh, it's in a common uh, coordinate system, so it's a high-resolution um, um, atlas. We're now getting ready to do things uh, both in mouse, uh, little pieces of mouse brain as well as little pieces of uh, human brain. And that reminds me, I actually brought a prop. Everybody brought a prop. And I got a prop. It's a raisin. Okay, so this raisin, let's say it's roughly, it's two by two by two millimeters, something like that. So if this is a piece of a human brain or, or monkey brain or mouse brain, it, lo it would look very, very similar. In fact, only an expert could distinguish whether it's one or the other. And this volume would contain roughly uh, uh, almost, uh, you know, half a million neurons and maybe uh, uh, four billion synapses and 10, kilometer, 10 to 12 kilometers of wiring, this tiny volume. And these neurons aren't just one uh, type. There's now evidence to, su to suggest there may be a thousand, up to a thousand different cell types. So it's by far 
The brain is by far the most complex um, a physical system in the known universe. And per volume, as I said, so far it seems to be the same whether it's a mouse brain or, or human brain. So we want to we wanna look, we want to characterize all the different types of cells. How do they look? How do they behave? What genes do they express? We do this both in mouse as well as in human tissue. In human tissue, obviously, you can't get a normal human brain tissue. So we use different techniques. We use stem cells. We grow little brains, human brains. And then also we, we, use, uh, we work with a variety of neurosurgeons. So here you have a piece of the brain where the yellow arrow points to. It's, part of, it's a brain called the hippocampus. And in this case, it's dysfunctional. And in this case, for this particular patient, it gives rise to epileptic seizure. And to prevent those seizures that can't be controlled by drugs for this patient anymore, the neurosurgeon will take in, will go in and remove that part of the brain and that the patient is tissue free. In order to access the hippocampus, he has to sort of drill a tunnel and he has to remo remove that overlying normally looking piece of brain in that red box. And that's what he's done here. So we stand outside the OR with a, with a special uh, um, um, cooled um, liquid um, um, container. He drops it, the surgeon drops it inside, and then we quickly drive to the lab, and then we do all sorts of different experiments. We dice it, and we slice it, we can cultivate it for several, uh, for several days, and then we can characterize in very high, at the level of individual neurons, we can characterize the electrical behavior. So Carl already talked, Carl Dysov talked already about these little blimps, these action potential, these pulses, the, univer the universal currency of communication. Brr, brr, you can listen to them when you put them on an audio monitor. So that's one. And you can do this, you can sort of characterize by their electrical behavior, you can characterize them. You can inject a, a, some a chemical substance and then use semi-automatic computer methods to reconstruct both the input, here you, you see the red, uh, the, 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 the pyramidal shape, the dendritic tree. You can also restruct, um, reconstruct the, the, the output. This is the, the wire, the output wire. So you can characterize the different shapes, and there are many, many different shapes. And then you can also get the mRNA. You can suck out the mRNA, uh, mRNA and analyze it for that cell to see what genes are expressed. And like I said, you can do this uh, in, in human tissue that previously was, was discarded as medical waste by and large. And we can also do it, under, of course, in a much more controlled condition in, in mice. And then again, we can study, uh, we can contrast and compare where the difference is. The, the most, uh, for in terms of uh, theory of consciousness, uh, the, by far the most plausible theory of consciousness is a theory called Integrated Information Theory of consciousness, uh, consciousness by the Italian-born American neuroscientist and psychiatrist Giulio Tononi. It essentially postulates that consciousness, that experience, bewusst, bewusster wahrnehmung, that experience originates from high, or is intrinsic to highly organized pieces of matter. That if you have, a, if you have, a, if you have matter and it's highly organized in a very particular way, not just in a, in a wishy-washy way, but in a very particular way that you can describe precisely, there will be conscious experience associated with it. And this, such a theory would in principle explain many facts about consciousness, why it goes away at night, why it disappears during hypersynchronized activity, during epileptic seizure. It would also explain, um, if we knew the, the individual components and their complexity, the circuit complexity, why, cort why cortex gives rise to consciousness, but, but uh, um, uh, not the cerebellum, why, for example, your immune system isn't, isn't conscious. You have no conscious experience with your immune system. But in order to test those theories, we, we, um, we really need to go to the neuronal level and we need to un understand the, the, the individual components at mass scale, all the different cell types and how they interact in a very specific tissue. And through so this, ultimately, and by ultimately, I don't mean in the fullness of time, it, 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 I mean in my lifetime, I want to understand this problem before I die. Um, this is the passion that's driven me for the last 30 years. I'd like to understand, the, so we know those two things are intimately linked. On the one hand, you have this incredible, as I said, the most complex uh, system in the known universe. On the other hand, we have a conscious experience. We have the inner world of experience that we all enjoy. At night it goes, it's clicked off, but sometimes, of course, it reappears again in our dreams. And um, uh, we, we'd like to understand the relationship between those two systems. We'd like to understand which other brains have it. What about a fetus? What about a newborn? What about a dog, a cat? What about a, a, a bird? What about a bee? What about a fly? And then ultimately, of course, we also want to understand it. Could this system ever have it? Not, not now, but maybe like in the movie Her, Samantha, maybe in 10 or 20 years. And if not, why not? What is it about this system that does not give rise to, to consciousness? 
So thereby we hope to understand how, how the water of the wine, uh, how the water of the brain is ultimately turned into the wine of our conscious experience. You don't need, I'm already